Okay. But yes, it'll be nice to have this recorded so that we can uh, make sure that we capture all of the great ideas surfaced here. So welcome to our, our whips and chips session today. Um, just a quick reminder of where this fits, especially for people who are joining a Go, our Go Fair US series for the first time. So of course, um, data together is a statement that was made uh, uh, last spring between CoData, GoFair, RDA, and the World Data System. And I know many of us are involved in most of these, some of these. Um, even though uh, what, we're, what we're doing today is under the GoFair US umbrella, um, and that's because we really concentrate on uh, uh, fair implementation. Things that we talk about um, might be appropriate to bring back to RDA for um, interest groups, working groups, publishing outputs and guidelines. And then of course, CoData for interesting policy things and the world data system, especially uh, where it has to do with, um, they're really leading the way, especially on trustworthy data. Just to, um, I won't have too many of these slides, I promise, but just to um, kind of give you some of the nomenclature about GoFair. So we have these three pillars that, um, that we work through for fair implementation that basically address where culture change is needed, training uh, or technology. Uh, there's the international office that is in the Netherlands and in non-pandemic times, we have a lot of fun meeting together in Leiden. And there are also national offices. What GoFair US does that isn't um, done by another country office or isn't done by the um, international office is really look at it through the lens of the research landscape in the US, um, what is happening with funders, what is happening with research budgets and institutional budgets, um, and try to uh, adapt things um, and also bring back opportunities that we think connect to uh, things our stakeholders are interested in, because you can't be at every meeting, you can't read every paper. And so, um, you know, we, we of course love when um, our members bring us things that that everyone else would like to see as well. There are a lot of implementation networks. And on the last slide, um, if, if you were able to read the six point font, you would have seen that if you're in RDA and you um, uh, discuss things in a working group, then the cor corollary for GoFair is this implementation network. And so we try to track the ones that are of specific interest to um, our members and people we work with and bring you back and plug you into to what's happening. Okay, so now onto the whips and chips. So we came up with this idea. We said, but the name's terrible. We're gonna have to think of something else because it just sounds weird. But then it was so memorable, we kept it. So, you know, the thing we're gonna call whips and chips, but isn't whips and chips. And so anyway, after about 10 times we gave up. So this is very informal. This comes, um, from different models we've seen, like the birds of a feather um, that you've seen at, at conferences um, for years, that is someone standing up at lunch saying, hey, I wanna talk about this topic. Um, the, the whip idea actually comes from IT conferences where it was a little more formal and that we had a room and that someone would get up in front and talk about something they're working on so that people had a basis for connecting. And especially IT people like myself, we. Um, we're so socially awkward that we need a, a venue to identify ourselves so that others know to find us. But, but um, on our first few webinars, you know, we, we had great presenters, great discussions. Um, and some of what came out in the chat was so interesting that we really need a way to promote the work of the members and bring them into the middle of the conversation. So that's what today's about. It's uh, showcasing what you're working on or showcasing a problem that you see that you'd uh, you know, like to further discussion on. These are just some uh, guideposts about uh, what you might wanna talk about. Of course, give us a title um, or make up a title so we don't have to say uh, that thing that Catherine's working on, for example. Um, let us know how early you are or how late you are in the process. Just give us a quick idea. It does, you don't have to have slides. You don't have, it doesn't have to be um, a fully thought out thing. And especially let people know why they might wanna join forces with you and what you would need or what you're looking for if applicable 
and then also where you think it might be used. After we do a few uh, whips, we're going to move into the chips, and that's much simpler. It's basically, I see a gap, and you don't have to have a fix for it, but if you do, let us know what that blue sky thing would look like. Okay, so this will be hard. Again, this is an experiment. Uh, we've not done it before in, in a virtual environment. If you could try to stick to five minutes, maybe seven, and then um, give people a couple minutes for discussion. Uh, we have, I believe, um, four people who, sorry, three people who um, uh, raised their hand to talk about their whip. And we have at least two people who want to talk about their chip. So I think we should have ample time um, and a great discussion. Okay, so with that, I'd like to um, in, invite Maria and Aaron first. I can stop sharing my slides, not that you need slides, um, but just so that you, I'm not dominating with my screen. Cool. Um, we put together some slides. Hi, everybody. I'm Erin Robinson. Um, and I can share my screen. And Maria and I are going to tag team this a little bit. Um, so this is pretty exciting for me because this is the first time that I've given the Fair Island talk. So um, I'm really excited to share the Fair Island project and particularly really the WIP that we're um, sharing is the data policy update. So we've been working on a data policy um, for this project. So just to give you a sense, Fair Island is a real place. Um, it's in the French Polynesian um, and it's off of a, a larger island, Morea, where the University of California and LTER have a site. Um, and so Fair Island is actually known as the Teddy Aroa Atoll um, and is managed by the Teddy Aroa Society. So it's a really unique spot. It has one of the most pristine coral reefs um, anywhere on earth. Um, and it's a really interesting opportunity for us to test fair data policies um, and data management um, tools and techniques and practices with researchers coming to this island. So this is another, um, gives you a sense of what's going on. The only thing on this atoll is the Brando Hotel um, and it's managed by the Teddy Aroa Society. And I'm calling this out because, because it's managed by a private foundation, it gives us some leverage for researchers wanting to come to this site. Um, and then also they have an incentive really for understanding the ecosystem of the island and wanting to know a lot about um, what's going on there. And because they have that curiosity, they are really interested in good data management practices. So it's this kind of perfect opportunity to bring um, interesting research together with really interesting data management problems that we've all been um, facing. So one of those interesting science opportunities is something called the IDEA Consortium. And many of you might be familiar with the idea of a digital twin. And so when scientists are coming to do research on Teddy Aroa, they're also coming to do and to provide their research as part of this IDEA Consortium, which then is creating this digital twin. So that's one of the scientific drivers um, for why they would want to participate in this and why they would wanna share their data. So our project, the data management side of this has three goals. One is to look at and optimize research data management policies and really for place-based research. So what are the special things about a place-based system um, that we can create policies for? Then the next piece um, where we're working with Maria is on the machine actionable data management plan. So how do we tie the policy to the data management plan? And how does that data management plan continue to live throughout the life of the research? And then to analyze this downstream effect of can we do better research, more interesting research, new research um, through this bounded incubated environment? Um, and then um, how does, what does that look like? What are we learning from that? And because we have, like I mentioned, the nonprofit governance side of this, um, it's an enforceable strategy for us. So um, there's some additional controls here that we don't have other places. So really it looks, um, those goals come together in, in this kind of ugly diagram, I'm not um, graphically so strong, but um, we're bringing the data policy, the data management plans and other, integrated existing infrastructure together 
um, hoping that what we learn on Teddy Aroa will then allow us to expand to other place-based research sites. And then also that we'll continue to analyze, iterate and improve this. So we know that the work that we're sharing today, for instance, is just the first step in you know, seeing how this works in real life, iterating on it and continuing to improve it. So that's the gist. Um, Maria, before I dive into the data policy, anything you wanna add as an intro? I think you're covering it. I'll let you. Cool. Continue. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the one of the things that um, has been going on is creating this data policy for the place. And so um, this gives you just a high level overview. Um, what we're asking, as I mentioned, there's this idea scientific project that's going on. So the policy links to the idea project. Um, and it says that the researchers coming to the island will make their, their data and metadata available to each other um, through this idea of a data trust. Um, that'll facilitate data reuse. And they have a code of conduct, which in addition to creating a safe space for research, also is really um, includes elements of open data sharing within this place um, so that we're hoping that we can push the envelope on um, sharing data ahead of publication um, for the people who are agreeing to this data policy. Um, we have gone back and forth about legally binding. It's not legally binding. Um, and it does, it follows both the FAIR and the CARE principles. So for Teddy Aroa, um, it was important that CARE also was included here. So it's, it's I think, an interesting first step. Um, and I'm happy to dive into more conversation if people have questions about it. Um, so then, Maria, I was hoping that you could talk to the next two slides, just the DMP tool and the IDs. Sure. So a big part of Fair Island is working on machine actionable data management plans, which is something that um, CDL has been working on for a number of years now through the DMP tool. We have an existing NSF grant to an eager grant to work on machine actionable data management plans. So Fair Island is kind of our first real life use case of the sort of machine actionable infrastructure that we've built. And uh, so working with Aaron, we're in Fair Island, we're able to actually test out all of these new features that we've been adding, our new um, metadata schema that we've incorporated into the tool. So basically the way it works is as people uh, request access to the field station, um, they're required to accept the, the policies that Aaron was laying out. They also have to fill out a data management plan. So explaining what data they're gonna create, um, where this data uh, will live, um, any licensing issues, sensitive data, those types of issues all recorded in data management plan. Um, so, and that is machine actionable and tracked through the use of identifiers. Uh, if you could go to the next yes. slide. Um, so this is kind of mapping out the ways in which the identifier um, ecosystem is kind of crucial to what we're building out in Fair Island and how we're able to use the machine actionable data management plan as a way to track and update research throughout the life cycle um, so that an institution like the Tetaroa Society could have a strong um, connection between those who are seeking access to the field station and the eventual outputs for a project. So by the use of identifiers, we're able to automate a lot of these tracking um, and eventually have um, kind of a, a dashboard interface where we can really see all of the outputs um, that were generated and all of the scholarly kind of connections that are made possible through the use of identifiers. So Fair Island is a really exciting project um, for this piece of it because it really allows us to test it out and see how it's working in a very controlled environment so that we can iterate on it. And once we can expand it to other applications, we've already kind of gone through this sort of pilot case where we've worked out some of the kinks, identified gaps, um, and ha have a more comprehensive ecosystem, I think, um, to release for other use cases. That's kind of our big picture goal for that. Perfect. Um, and that actually leads nicely right into um, just a quick snapshot of where we hope that we're going. So um, with the, the, the DMP tool and being part of the UC system, 
we're hoping that um, some of the things that we learn with Fair Island will expand to the broader UC NRS system. So those are the sites that you see here. Um, and also across this four site Pacific Transect Collaborative, um, which includes three other islands, um, Maria that I mentioned, and then Palmyra and Oahu um, are also involved. So those are some ways that we're hoping to expand this out. But um, the other thing that Maria was, was just mentioning was about the reuse of existing tools and technologies. And so one of the things I'm hoping to get out of this conversation and participating with GoFair US is you know, what are the things that other people are developing that you want to try out in this kind of controlled environment too. So with that, I will stop and um, thanks for the opportunity. Awesome, thank you so much. So um, is there any specific call for um, participants or um, ways that people could get involved? Yes, um, so one, one easy way, and I'll put this in the chat. Um, so we're still, we're looking for feedback on the, um, the data policy. And so I'll put a form in the chat. So that's one way, um, but the other is less formal. So I think if you wanted to send Maria and me an email, um, if you have an idea of things you'd like to experiment in this controlled environment, those are things that we're, um, we're still in sort of the startup phase of this project um, and, um, So that, um, that is that. And I see a question from John. Um, is there a way to leverage RDA for the Fair Island project? I would be curious to hear from RDA folks. So I guess I'm on tab, so maybe I can um, try. <laughs> there are so many working groups though, and so many interest groups that it is hard to keep track of what they all do. Um, I think that especially your your policy piece, it would be interesting to see if there's a an interest group where you could take that and have it be an official output where you just formally ask mm -hmm. for feedback. Mm -hmm. um, that'd be one. And then the the call for proposals for the next plenary, if you can believe it, because I know we haven't had uh let's see, we just had a plenary. <laughs> um, but um the call for um uh, the International Science Week, which of course already oh, yet should open in May or June, and okay. um, you could have a BOF, or you could um, join forces with one of the established groups. But I would just recommend a BOF on this. I think your idea of having a like a how, what you're doing with digital twins and how you're really trying to show it in action as an as a data experiment along with the live experiment is really novel. So, Christine. Um... Maybe we can we can ask for uh, your influence. Um, we we proposed our first buff um, for this the one that's upcoming. So whatever is that P seventeen P seventeen yeah. Um, so we're hoping this is the first time that we've proposed a buff and we've never done that before. So we're hoping that that will go for P seventeen um, and then yeah, thinking about what happens what happens right. after, but. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm already thinking of this as past because my piece in it in the process is past because it starts so early. But yes, yeah. you're way ahead of me. And I didn't remember because I think it's not part of the title, right? It might not be part of it. Yeah, Fair yeah. Island isn't in the title. I think we just called it place-based. We should use our title so that so our title is one of the sexy parts of our project. <laughs> Memorable. Sure. There you go. Well, I can't. Um, Confirm or deny, but I um, I think they'll be getting back to people soon. So and okay, cool. <laughs> okay, so so next up, and I saw um, at least Katarina here. I'll just share my screen for a minute for the title. Um, but Katarina, I can of course turn it back over to you, and if any of your other um, collaborators are here to tell us more about the Fair Clinic for Citizen Science projects in the cultural heritage sector. Hello. Um, thanks for uh, making a, a small place uh, for us. My name is Katerina Zuru and uh, Mariana Ziku is also here with us. Um, we are not in the US, so we, we share with you uh, the fun, the engagement around FAIR. Um, uh, we are, I am located in Greece and my, Mariana is located in, in Canada. 
we, we belong in an EU funded project, which is called Citizen Heritage. Please allow me to, to put some, um, some notes um, in the chat. So this project um, is, is about uh, Our project is about um, citizen, citizen science in the cultural heritage sector. Um, we explore the role of universities in supporting citizens in uh, data observations, but not only data observations, into involvement in, in scholar activity. Uh, and we take as, uh, as, uh, as, se as sector the cultural heritage sector. Um, now, we have been going through an analysis of several um, citizen science projects uh, that have uh, to do with, for instance, um, metadata or annotations or um, hackathons about uh, cultural heritage in Europe. And uh, the reason why we are here and also what we, we try to do with, with Mariana is to look a bit at the data or at the citizen driven data in citizen science projects. Right, so citizen science is, is a component of, of open science, but not all citizen science data are, are, um, are at least um, findable, not to mention uh, fair. Right. This is why we are not experts in fair, but we we we, we wish to apply a model of, of understanding uh, the, the fair dimension of this citizen-driven data, if if there is. Um, so uh, we think of applying uh, a model that we found. Uh, it's a European model, uh, and. I don't know if you are aware of it. I'm sharing it here. It is. It's also from um, from a European project. The, the European project is called Parthenos. It is about uh, archaeology and history and uh, science of of culture, and they have been uh, developing a fair data model. They call it. Uh, a tool to verify data management and make data reusable. So we were thinking of using uh, the Parthenos uh, tool to screen the citizen-driven data that we have gathered, we have ga gathered in, in our project. Uh, that was uh, our very short uh, um, introduction. Apologies if we are not experts in FAIR. Uh, it is indeed, um, a high priority in Europe and now, and I think it will continue to be, as there is lots of work to do around uh, making that uh, fair. Thanks for listening. Yes, super. Well, and I don't think anyone um, is necessarily the experts. We're all uh, figuring <laughs> it out together and advancing the field. And it's one of those things that the more you know, the more gaps there are, and you're never sure if it's something you don't know or if it just doesn't exist. So you're in good company here. Um, are there any questions or do people have, uh, you know, things they'd like to hear a little bit more about from Katerina? I, I, yeah, I wanted to ask about the, um, I guess the decision-making of like how you landed on um, that particular um, service to um, look at it you know, understanding if the, the metadata, the data is fair and uh, did you sort of review other other services or other tools as well or? Um, in, Europe, in Europe at this stage, there are, there are tools to assess the fairness of um, digital infrastructures like digital libraries, okay? You, you take a library and you have a kind of methodology according to which you can assess the degree of, uh, of fairness or these, these four components, but not yet on, on data sets um, themselves. I think the interoperability, especially of data sets, is, is, very, is a very tricky issue, especially when we talk about, you know, citizen um, collected and uh, aggregated uh, data. I don't know, Chris, if I answer your your um, your question, but there is 
still not a, a range of tools, not even a couple of tools that we can apply, um, like uh, in an arborescence where you say, you take this data set, is it F? What kind of components do you, you know, use to qualify whether it is an F or an I or an A, you know, or, or an R, um, et cetera. I don't know how, how things are in the US. No, that I that was behind my question, basically uh, your questions as well. So, because I'm, I'm looking at all the different uh, tools as well and services and trying to understand, you know, how they assess. But, but Chris, Chris, have have a look at this link uh, on Zenodo. Zenodo is is the uh, you know the international repository of of open data. Uh, there, and this is the link to this tool, the Parthenos tool. Perhaps you, you'll find it. This is the one that we think we may use. So perhaps okay. it's also useful for you. All right. Well, we yeah, I've got it open. Back in and let us know how it works. And let us know if this is a good direction. And of course, we love to read your papers or anything else you produce. And sorry, Chris, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I just said I had it. I have it open. <laughs> she said, oh, open it. I have it open. <laughs> I'm going to look at it. Yes. Thank, thank you for sharing this. Yes, Katarina, thank you for joining us. And especially we know usually we host post things at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific so that it's the end of the work day, <laughs> not um, before bedtime. But thank you for uh, staying up with us. <laughs> You're a very engaging so, yeah. community. Thank you for organizing these calls. So uh, next up, I'd like to invite Katie. If, if um, you're ready. All right. Yeah, I am. I have I have a little bit a little bit of slides um, that I'll share. So, hi, I'm Katie Knight. Uh, I work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I'm a data engineer and information architect there. And um, this uh, came out of a conversation that I had with Chris uh, last month um, about data stewardship. So I I work on projects that are um, very very data heavy. Um, I sit in the advanced data and work group workflows group um, at the lab where um, we try to help with data management on projects across the lab. So it's all sorts of science disciplines. And then um, I'm also on a lot of projects for the VA data. We host the data for the um, Veterans Affairs. Um, so it's a massive, massive medical data set. And as you might imagine, there's lots and lots of problems and everybody's um, very interested in fair data. But what I've run into in all of the different events that I've attended about FAIR and everything I've read about FAIR is um, there's not a lot of uh, instructions for how to operationalize this and how I could bring data stewardship to the lab, what I could, how I could even describe it to them. Um, and so in terms of um, the current state of affairs of what I've been able to find, um, there was a pilot course um, offered in November by CoData about an introduction to FAIR data stewardship um, there's the Fair Data Stewardship Wizard, um, which will help you um, with your data management plan, and that's great. Um, Baron Mons has written this book, um, Data Stewardship for Open Science, also awesome. Um, but in terms of something that I could give to my management and say, this is what data stewardship looks like, and this is how we professionalize it in terms of the lab, that feels like that's really lacking. Um, so in terms of what I mean by a data steward, um, I'm using the definition that the Dutch uh, Tech Center for Life Sciences put out, um, with somebody trained professionally to handle data um, to ensure that um, any type of research producing data, the data is fair. And they have a data stewards interest group, um, which is awesome, but this group um, understandably is, it's a platform for data stewards in the Netherlands to share their experience and it's to foster Dutch national implementation of data stewardship. So while their readings are open to everybody, um, it's there's nothing that might necessarily address some of those maybe specific problems, um, like with the medical data in the US, for instance. So Chris recommended taking a look at the US Research Software Engineer Association and how they have um, their association set up as maybe a possible jumping off point for how we could create our own data stewards interest group for GoFair US. Um, so this uh, U.S. Research Software Engineer Association, um, it's uh, across universities, laboratories, knowledge institutes, um, and it's a, a central um, coherent association for people who identify with the role of software engineer to help them promote research, to help them provide useful resources with one another, um, access to material. 
And so what we're proposing with this data stewards interest group for GoFair US is a place where all people in data management or data stewardship roles can share experiences about data stewardship in the US um, to share tools and training opportunities and materials, which would be super, super helpful for someone like me at a big national lab where I'd like to do more than just describe FAIR to people. I'd like to tell them exactly how to do this. Um, uh, how to survey the community to understand the trends, um, certainly the gaps, um, and then just general, like, what are the needs um, for professionalizing data stewardship, for sharing standards, for promoting standards, um, and really, uh, uh, for me, this would be amazing um, use cases. So if you think about verifying material science data, that's going to look very, very different than verifying medical data. Um, and having these types of use cases and having people who work in those um, environments to come talk um, from a data stewardship standpoint would be really, really amazing. So Chris and I are proposing um, a first meeting on April 30th of this year from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, I will put this URL in the chat um, and then it's a sign up sheet for everyone to sign up if you want to and um, we'll send out a link for the first meeting. And if you have questions, um, Chris and I are both here. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to mark my calendar. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to. Yay. It's nice to um, to know the people working, you know, in the U.S. in the space, and and also what the what the demand is. Uh, I mean, there's so many things that we could work on, but what's needed first, or the first five things that we would all want. And it is a European friendly time and all are welcome. Um, we just don't have, our funders aren't yet requiring um, and verifying all the things that they do in the EU. And so that's why some of our approaches are a little bit different. Because for example, we there are very few projects where researchers are made to spend X percentage on, on data, for example. So we, we have to be creative in how we get researchers to do this. So any questions or comments? I wanted to uh, um, mention a couple of things. I'm Nancy Hobelheinrich. Hello, Katie. Haven't met you yet. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to, I, I don't know if you know that there's a, a RDA group that's interested in professionalizing data stewardship that's just started uh, that you might want to look into. There also, uh, there's a group out of the uh, European Open Science Cloud uh, that has a, a whole a project that talks about skills for data stewardship for a range of people from researchers through data librarians with different uh, really nice explanation of what different what different use cases are for those those each of those different kinds of uh, stakeholders in terms of the process and then what skills would be associated with it and they're they're doing a lot of work related to uh, defining that and putting that into some kind of either competency framework curriculum framework that sort of thing uh, so that's something that would might be really useful to look at. I can, uh, if you know, it's already there. Great. <laughs> Susan has that added, added that. The other thing is to uh, mention in terms of finding training materials for, for data stewards and so on, that the ESAP has a data management training clearinghouse that has all kinds of training materials associated uh, or targeted to people who, again, though that same range of, of people, not, not described the same way, but certainly data librarians and people who teach or in, instructing unfair uh, as well as researchers themselves. So that's something you might want to look at just to see uh, you know, what's there. And then if, if you find anything that looks like it'd be useful to include in that, then you know you can submit it fairly easily too. But but that's there are definitely other people working on, on it as well. So it'd be nice that's, to that's join wonderful. forces. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay, Thank you. great. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I'll just reiterate. So I, I am the TAB liaison to the um, RDA data stewardship. And not just accidentally, like I'm so interested in this topic. And uh, just to give you a, um, a flavor of what they're working on, so you can think of how um, you know you might plug in, but also where um, you have things that are, are different than what they're working on. So they have um, eight challenges that they've identified. They have a group that's working on business cases, a group working on terminology, models, job profiles, training, career tracks, networking and certification. 
they did have one that was on events, but I think it, it's hard to start up everything at the same time. And so I'm guessing that one will surface again. I put in the chat their Slack channel because I think, of course, go to the RDA website and you can just click join group if you're interested. But um, I think joining the Slack channel is a great way to plug in, um, you know, without necessarily committing. And you can, they're very open. They have um, frequent calls for input and um, they meet not always on times that are friendly to the U.S., but I think they're nice people and might adjust if if uh, uh, people ask for other times. But I think this is very timely and just so much work is needed in this area. Uh, okay, ha let's see. I don't know if I will be getting myself in trouble if I um, invite people or if I can even invite people. So let me look that up during one of the next talks, um, if that's okay. And I will let you know in the chat. So Chris, did you have, did you have a, a whip to present today? Why, yes, I do. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of someone who's actually um, hopefully resting right now. <laughs> but I, I can't share um, my slides apparently. Um, so I will send them to you, Christine. Um, so you can actually uh, um, present on behalf, my behalf. That's kind of weird, um, but I will. I will ask you to it's go no next problem. slide. <laughs> I think you're going to win for name of a project today. So I was already teasing you about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so my so the person I I've been working with is uh, Sarah um, El Gabali. She's um, She's actually someone I know well from the Carpentries community, but she also um, uh, works on another project called Open Cider. Um, and that is a, um, a resource for computational inclusion. Um, so if you want to check that out as well. And her, uh, I mean, her, her uh, Twitter handle is that, but uh, you can also look at Open Cider. Um, but next slide. Um, so yeah, we were we were working on um, a lesson in the carpentries on fair data and software, and it, it is has been um, moving slowly. I think it it you know takes time to collaborate with you know people around the world and and make changes over time. Um, so next slide, um, we started thinking about something that um, maybe more lightweight, something that. Um, could be could evolve rapidly because fair is, is sort of evolving rapidly. Um, there's a lot of work going on in the space. Um, you know, carpentry style of lesson development takes time, um, and you know, making um, fair more accessible to researchers. So you know, that that last slide I showed you is a library carpentry lesson, and I know some some of the people working on on that lesson have been saying, you know, well, we we need something that's a little more you know broader, uh, not just Maybe research data management libraries, you know, but some something that's, uh, you know, more researcher driven, um, and then um, a preference, right? So you know, the, the the really the trend is that people like to pick, mix, and match material from all sorts of places based on what um, what you know what their current uh, scenario is, you know, what 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 they're sort of teaching, particularly about fair. Or you know what what interests their community. Uh, so next slide. Um, so yeah, we were we were thinking of a more dynamic resource, um, just provide a framework for these fair conversations, invite experts to speak on fair topics. Um, I know that sounds like what we're doing right now, <laughs> but um, to have sort of more of a collaborative note taking. Um, Q and A ses uh, side of it, um, kind of like in the carpentry's vein. Um, and, and within that session sort of develop um, based on, you know, the, the speaker coming in, speaking of a particular topic theme of developing sort of the top things that researchers need to, to know about, you know, top, you know, the simple rules is another thing that you see, see often uh, out there, 10 simple rules, but sort of develop these simple rules, top things and, you know, publish a, a summary of, of some of the, the items that were discussed and, and publish them fairly quickly as fair bytes, you know, some quick uh, reference material that people can sort of grab, um, have a grab bag, you know, of, of, of material from, but also, you know, to have sort of like this, this um, um, 
you know, really a reference style um, resource that, you know, you can, you can almost um, subscribe to like a newsletter, um, you know, getting, getting these resources in, in um, over time. And so um, fair bites uh, can be an evolving resource for the community to draw from. Um, so next slide. Um, we're thinking that um, this could live on the GoFair US site um, um, as a separate section called bytes. Um, and next slide, um, we would use really just uh, flexible tools, um, uh, you know, just off the shelf tools um, and, and make it fairly open. So people um, around the world could sort of organize their own kind of fair bite sessions. Um, but, you know, again, at the end of the day, provide them the framework for contributing it, you know, contributing their, their um, sessions, but also contributing what they uh, develop from them back into this resource, this fair bytes resource. Um, so Google Forms or Google Calendar, um, GitHub, um, potentially Etherpad or Google Docs. Uh, so next slide. Um, so we, we already had actually a session with some people from the Carpentries community about what they would like to see in a Fairbyte session. And we had some really interesting things already pop up as, as a topic. So CSV on the web, it's, it's, it's actually a, a standard. Um, and someone was saying, you know, we, they could uh, speak about that, about structuring your CS, CSVs, um, fair work, fair and, and workflows. Um, so really interesting idea of sort of walking through researcher workflows and, and seeing, you know, how fair can be applied in, in that, in, in the process of doing research and the tools that they use. So, you know, in, in the example we had, we had R and R studio um, of someone sort of walking through some parts of it and talking about how things could be more fair in, in that, in that workflow. Um, data stewardship workflows, um, you know, how we could be more fair in our practices, um, how to make, lesson material, training material more fair, um, making your data more fair, that's, that's a usual <laughs> one. Uh, we had some researchers in there that were interested in that aspect. Uh, the topic of fair, whether it's global enough, and so we've actually had some pushback, you know, I think from um, some services in the community saying that, that there's a lot of development in, involved in becoming more fair, you know, moving your service to, to a, mer a more fair service. Uh, so some of our repositories um, may not necessarily have the resources to do that, but it's also from the sense of, um, you know, what, whether you're in a region, region where the resources are, are hard to come by. Um, and then uh, fair and disciplines is another popular one. Um, you know, people want to see how it's applied in, in particular disciplines um, and, and fair solutions. I think particularly about software, there was interest in that, but also um, interlinking all these, uh, you know, pit, persistent identifiers and um, really seeing the value from, from, um, from, your, um, from your work and, you know, from, from the fair work that we're doing. So I, I think of Scholix, you know, when uh, one of the services that, that's trying to, to do that interlinking resources or we heard actually from uh, DMP tool as well. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, those are some really interesting uh, topics that already came up just from one session. Um, next slide. Uh, we also have um, a link, <laughs> and uh, actually, Sarah created this really great image for our the series. <laughs> um, we're still in sort of development phases, and and that's what the form is about. Um, just to, um, um, letting us know you're interested. You also can sort of uh, in the process identify any topics you'd like to. Um, um, speak about, or, um, you know, just if you wanted, wanted to be involved. Um, so, uh, I don't know if, uh, Christine, you can share that link, uh, or I can actually, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll share that in, in the chat, just like everyone else has, and I can, uh, stop there. I was on mute. Okay, thank you so much for that, Chris, and for the, uh, wonderfully named topic. We were laughing because it, on the website mock-up, it almost looked like it said, go fair US bites. <laughs> <laughs> a good follow-up to our, um, to the uh, go fair yourself sticker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the contraband that made it out of the German office. 
<laughs> I, I did change that. Yes. <laughs> go, go fair US bites. But yeah, um, it, we're, we're not set on the name either. <laughs> no, I like it. I, I mean, I think it, it's funny and it's catchy. So I'm not complaining. I quite the opposite. Um, I, I did want to say I just really love the idea of nano publications and people sharing, you know, their knowledge in smaller bites. And so that really appeals to me. And it looks like you had a couple other um, uh, comments in the in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, Susanna had a um, saying plus one to the to yeah. That's what we are also calling them guides. Um, and uh, um, I have to read this. Uh, I'm, I probably have <laughs> to reread the six recommendations to implement fair and practice that she shared. <laughs> Yeah, there are six, but there are 37 pages. I think I really love the idea of these bites and it, it's really important. I also wonder, Chris, how, how would you be able to do them perhaps without redo things, which is in 45 pages and you could summarize in short, because the problem here is absolutely the length and the clarity of the message, but also uh, potentially, if you know that there is a longer document that is useful, that you become the shorter version rather than create a completely separate one. I mean, this uh, is a, a problem for everybody else. I mean, the idea that we should not reinvent things, but things have been reinvented. Yeah, I think um, you're right. Um, I had some experience with this on the top 10 uh, uh, fair data and software things, and it was um, sometimes a challenge to summarize things and, and make them more concise. Um, so I think, I mean, I think there's just an, enough energy to try it. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, I think we'll iterate and see how we could um, structure these, com these, these presentations, conversations better so that they come in, they structure things so we can, you know, record them better. Um, and, and so we sort of started outlining that process to help us. Um, but most likely it will, it will be a little bit messy. Um, we'll have to fit if that picture was up of the, the salad tossing that, <laughs> that maybe, you know, like the process that we're, we're doing right now of, uh, of just trying to, you know, iterate through and see what, um, um, it, how we can improve this process. So, um, yeah. Thanks. And then I don't know if we, we covered it, but I just wanted to, um, uh, John raises a good point, which is why would things be on the GoFair US site versus another place? And so I think the, the um, quick answer is, you know, we want a place to try things out and to get them started. If people love it and it should be owned by a um, higher up the food chain and either the GoFair US entity or another place, say CDL, oh, you know, we're, we're open to wherever it should be. We just want to um, get the idea out there and show people through example what it might look like. Um, the, I actually can answer that. It's, it's simple. It's, it's actually more technical because the GoFair US site um, uses um, WordPress and we use GitHub, which is, you know, something that can be more open, transparent, um, that people can, can contribute to. Actually, people can already um, submit issues and pull requests on the GoFair US site, um, you know, versus a WordPress site, you can't really do that. Um, so it's really more technical at the moment. <laughs> I think that was the, that was the answer. Yeah, but you know, I guess my, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, just that um, my question wasn't necessarily that it, it's a bad idea. It was more just to say that, um, if people go to a website uh, that's branded Go Fair, Go Fair, they may be looking for information about approaches that Go Fair endorses, and not and that and that seems to me not to be the focus of this this approach. It's more to give general fair bite size fair information, and I just was bringing it up as something that you might have to mitigate as you're navigating promoting this, but with a Go Fair logo at the top. It's just something to think about. Not that it's a bad idea, but just that it's it's dueling dueling community approaches. You know, one is very structured and one is more open and fluid. And so you'll just have to kind of navigate that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, we're we're navigating that. It, it it's kind yeah. of um, I mean, 
at, in general, I think it's a, it's, we work as a team, I think more, more and more, um, uh, the go fair U S and go fair. Um, but I think, you know, that that's, yeah, I, I mean, you've identified some, some ways of how we work, um, versus, you know, sometimes how go fair works. Um, but, you know, I think that there's, there's collaboration going on there. Um, so. Well, this is exactly, um, what we had hoped would be fun about whips and chips. It's not just here's my thing and digest it. It's yeah. Okay. How, what are we missing? What are other opportunities? And there's um, just for time, I'm going to move on to whips, but there's a, a few other things um, in the chat, Chris, um, please. I, I hope you'll check out. So I want to see if um, I don't know if, if anyone is on from this group and let me make sure I'm in the right window. Here we go. But they, they were going to be our first challenge in progress on making the data published in the supplementary material of an article fair. Okay. Um, I, I believe then if, if, they're, if they're not here or if I moved on too quick, we can come back to them. Uh, Nancy Hobel Heinrich also had one um, and I'd like to invite her to talk about it a bit. Okay, yeah, let's see, let me find the video here. That's that sounds great, although actually that was a, the, the uh, title you have is not what, what I was going to present okay. to talk about, but so no, no need to, to go over it. What I do wanna do is share a one, I don't have slides, but I wanna uh, put a link into the uh, chat that people can look at that I can I can reference and maybe I can just show that can I share my screen and show so what I've got here um, what I wanted to talk about was the fact that uh, one of the things that we did a we was it means a couple of people from the East Earth Science Information Partners ESIP community and also from GoFair were involved in, in setting up a, a workshop at ESIP summer last year in July. And uh, what we were trying to do was to give people an introduction to some of the tools that GoFair office uses for implementation of FAIR, including the FAIR, FAIR uh, implementation profile, which is a way to sort of state as a community, declare as a community what you're using for different kinds of tools and uh, standards and that sort of thing. And so the goals were partially to introduce people to that, but also to find out what people, where people were uh, in, in the whole understanding of what FAIR was. So we did a, we had a working session where the first one was kind of breaking out into different groups and, and asking people to address uh, the question of you know, what difficulties do they have or do they know their kind of clients, so to speak, have uh, in terms of implementing FAIR. And we broke it out into four breakout groups of for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And Christine was a moderator, as was, I'm not sorry, Christine was present, she wasn't a moderator, but Melissa Cragen was, and, and uh, Natalie Myers, and other, another uh, person from ESIP, Natalie Myers from GoFair as well. And um, we, people just went in and answered that question in a, in a form. And then the second part of the uh, session was to actually go through the tools and so on. And those recordings are available if you're interested in that. But what I wanted to share today was what, what those findings were and then ask for your, uh, if you're interested and uh, have knowledge to suggest to whom we might, to which stakeholders we might create some new uh, educational resources or training resources on fair implementation. So what I've got here that in this, in the, uh, and what, what I've given you, this should be open to the, to anybody who wants to, to comment. So you can certainly come back to it. You know, it's, there's not time to do it to do it all now, obviously or go over, but I wanted to just show you briefly what, what we found. There were some interesting, um, interesting, I, uh, an interesting range of, of, of knowledge and questions that people had ranging from, you know, what is fair really? And how, you know, why is it important? which is also maybe sometimes where the, some of the researchers are, right? What, what is it and why should we care about it? To you know, data repository people and data librarians who are trying to answer that question for people. So uh, it, especially in, in, in relation to specifically how you would implement. So this is an, I think it's an interesting uh, finding that you, that you can, uh, interesting findings that you can see. And as I said, it'd be really helpful 
uh, if you go through these and can just make comments about, you know, what if something if something else comes up that, that jogs your as you read it as something else comes up as a topic to add that or to but especially to kind of recommend from your experience your own knowledge uh, what who would be interested in this kind of topic you know what and I've got a list in this the comment I've made here that addresses that question and has a suggestion for stakeholders including researchers especially field researchers because EarthCube is interested in that but also data librarians, data repository managers, data publishers, or, or others, you know, who else are we looking at? And the results uh, of this, I think, will show up at, hopefully in a number of different communities, including ESIP, because there are people in ESIP who are interested in working on training resources as well, especially cross-discipline. So the, addressing that question that um, I think it was Catherine brought up, and, uh, and also the, the concept of data stewardship and, and where it all fits. So, I just want to, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but if you're, if you're interested, it's interested to see where, where we were. And granted, this was July of last year. So hopefully there's been progress made since then, but, but, uh, but if you've got comments or thoughts, it'd be great to hear them. Thank you so much, Nancy. Yeah. And again, the link is in the chat. If you'd like to go check it out and, and give her feedback. Okay. So we'll move on. I've, um, I've got, a chip that I wanted to present, but it's extremely quick. And then I want to let you know about um, our next webinar. So um, I'm involved in EarthCube, which is a US project that is at the intersections, intersection of geosciences and cyber infrastructure. We have a huge emphasis on how to make geosciences data fair. Um, we last year at our annual meeting in June of 2020, we had our first call for notebooks because we really believe in um, uh, Yolanda Gill's idea of the uh, paper of the future. Uh, and uh, the idea that, you know, a notebook really embodies um, what she described very well in that it's showing the tools and the data um, along with, you know, what you have to share. So we have um, 12 notebooks that were accepted and are now on the earthcube.org website. But one challenge that we have is, um, identifying proper metadata as a base set. And so we have a new template um, for the EarthCube call for notebooks, which will come out, I believe actually in the next few weeks. Um, but we would love to have additional input, especially from this community and experts like yourself on the call. So if you're at all interested, get in touch with me. I believe my email address is on the uh, registration for this webinar. I'm Christine at sdsc.edu, or join us on our EarthCube Slack, which um, I believe you can actually join, um, is earthcube.slack.com. Uh, okay, so with that, and so we can end on time, especially for um, our European partners who are probably tired and, and ready to wind down for the night. Um, on April 1st, and that's, that's not a joke, it, it is April 1st, at 9 a.m., a time much friendlier to those of you across the Atlantic, um, we have a fair on the ground webinar. Um, and we're so pleased to have Amanda Charbonneau, who's the project manager for the Common Fund Data Ecosystem. This is a National Institutes of Health, um, huge, huge data undertaking. Um, and uh, we will be put, posting more information about that on our website, uh, but we already have the uh, registration link posted if you'd like to put your name down and make sure that we send you more info. And so, I'll just add uh, quickly, Christine, oh, that uh, we, we do anticipate having someone from the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy, uh, and we're just uh, working on confirming who that will be. Perfect. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. For those of you who were in Atlanta with us in February 2020 for the um, uh, FAIR Capacity Building um, in data stewardship training capacity building, Amanda was there with us. Okay, so with that, um, just one minute over. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, good afternoon and good evening to each of you and hope to see you again in April. Take care. Thanks, Christine. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.